Several years ago, Elon Musk saw the right opportunity, a growing commercial space market, the United States government willing to privatize space travel, and the usual problem of rocket reusability. So he decided to create SpaceX, which became a truly disruptive company. And believe it or not, it's only getting started. In this video, I'll talk about SpaceX business model, the impact that it has on the space industry, and whether traveling to Mars could be a viable business or not. SpaceX is a private company and their finances are not disclosed to the general public. That's why analysts can only make educated guesses about the reality of its business model. However, let's get one thing out of the way right now. Many people pretend that SpaceX success can only be attributed to the subsidies of the US government. But that is simply not true. First of all, SpaceX did receive subsidies to develop some parts of its rockets, but so did most of the other American rocket companies. SpaceX didn't receive more than others. And now, SpaceX regularly benefits from government contracts, especially military ones, and again, many people argue that these contracts are overpaid, which would be another way of subsidizing it. When a regular launch costs about $60 million for a commercial company, a military client pays about $100 million. But that's because military missions are more complicated and have costly requirements. And if you look at what the costs for such launches were before, the price was way more expensive. So SpaceX is not only undercutting commercial launch costs, but even those of national security payloads and therefore disrupting existing American rocket companies. And finally, there's another thing to keep in mind. None of the rocket industries around the world would be able to survive without the regular contracts of their respective governments. This is how it works. Russian government will only use Russian rockets. Chinese will use Chinese. Indians will use Indian. And Europeans will use European. So the fact that SpaceX benefits from American government contracts is nothing exceptional. But speaking of Europeans and the Ariane 5 launcher, this is the one that will probably suffer the most from SpaceX Ascent. They both have rockets of similar capacity and power, and so far Ariane 5 is the most reliable launch vehicle in the world with a 98% success rate. It's so reliable that even NASA exceptionally chose it to launch the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be the successor to Hubble. It's the leader of commercial space launches, or so it was. Because Ariane days may be numbered, and the numbers might be smaller than expected. Already back in 2012, Elon Musk said that Ariane 5 has no chance against Falcon 9, and he even advised them to build another vehicle to be able to compete. Ariane 5 has, has no chance. There's really no way for that vehicle to compete with Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. If I were in the position of Ariane, I would really push for an Ariane 6. So they scrambled to develop the Ariane 6 for 2020, but it's already too little and too late. Even if Ariane 6 could compete with Falcon 9 a bit better because of cheaper prices due to a more industrialized production, it's not a revolutionary vehicle. And in the meantime, this happened. And it changed everything. Reusability is key to democratize space access. And this was Elon Musk's goal since the beginning. Sending expendable rockets to space is equivalent to building a plane for just one flight and then throwing it away. Imagine how much it would cost, right? It doesn't make any sense. And although reusability has been in the works at most space agencies around the world, none has really achieved it, until SpaceX did. Flying a recovered Falcon 9 could eventually cost up to 30% less than the full price, so closer to $50 million instead of 62. And although this low price hasn't been proposed to any client just yet, discounts of up to 10% have. And even if SpaceX could already put the price down to say $45 million, why would they do it? All they need is to be cheaper than anyone else. They don't need to go that low for as long as there are no competitors in this price range. When you look at this graph, here's Ariane 5, which can lift this much payload to low Earth orbit for that very high price here. And here's a new Falcon 9, which can lift slightly more and is much cheaper. 
Then, here's Ariane 6, so the answer to Falcon 9, which can lift the same amount for a much cheaper price than its previous version, but that is still more expensive than an expendable Falcon 9. And here's a used Falcon 9, which is yet cheaper. So Ariane 6 is not an answer good enough. This already started to give nightmares to other space agencies in the US and around the world lagging in this area here. But this was just the beginning. As you probably heard, SpaceX later introduced the Falcon Heavy in this fashion. And here's where Falcon Heavy is on the graph. It costs 150 million to launch in a fully expendable version. That's more expensive, of course, but it's still cheaper per kilogram. However, SpaceX also lists a price tag of $90 million for the Falcon Heavy, but doesn't specify which payload it can carry to low Earth orbit. They also don't specify the differences in price and payload depending on whether both the boosters and the first stage are recovered or when it's just the boosters. But based on some vague information from Elon Musk himself and independent calculations, this is a likely estimation. 90% of delivery power for a 95 million price tag would place a partly reusable rocket somewhere here. And 90 million dollars when the first stage is also recovered, but the payload would be significantly smaller, somewhere around here. So as you can see, the competition around this area here is still possible. That's because the reusability also requires a high cost of refurbishment, and so everything depends on the payload requirement of the client and whether it fits into a reusable version of a SpaceX rocket. Also, these prices can change and will change depending on whether the client is both paying for a used rocket and flying it in a reusable version. However, there is no competition in that area around here for now. But many rockets are in development, including Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin's New Glenn. That's why SpaceX is truly disruptive. As you can see, it's all about cutting the costs. Any percentage cheaper will be an economy of millions for the customers. That's also why Elon Musk congratulated the Indian Space Research Organization when they launched a record 104 satellites in a single flight. They also launched an orbiter around Mars for only $74 million. These accomplishments are proofs of efficiency and that's what impressed Elon Musk. Not the size, not the power, but how can you make things more cost efficient in such a complex industry? So, even if SpaceX rockets' reusability will take some time to be perfectly operational, it will eventually make it much more competitive than expendable rockets. And so while everyone will be tweaking their expendable rockets to be cheaper and cheaper to simply try to compete, SpaceX will do the same but also improve reusability in the meantime. Basically, countries which don't invest in reusability research right now will most likely forever lag behind. Russia is a proof of how a country can completely lose an industry in which it once was the best in the world. Some advanced space agencies, like the European ESA, could totally develop reusable rockets as well, so why aren't they doing it? The answer is not clear, but when you listen to Alain Charmeau, who is the former CEO of Ariane Group, he mentions a potential reason that is quite outraging. He says that reusability will kill a lot of jobs. Since the same rocket can fly several times, most jobs required to build new rockets will be eliminated. And that European countries won't accept this outcome because they prefer to preserve jobs. Which is another way to admit that this whole thing is subsidized and inefficient. So basically, their logic is to save these jobs in the short term just to lose the whole industry in the long term, which might actually be more like near term. Because look at this. In the beginning, I said that SpaceX was just getting started, and this wasn't an exaggeration. Up until 2016, Ariane was still launching more rockets than SpaceX, and so they used this as an argument to shrug off SpaceX competition. Like, yeah, we're still having more clients than them. 
But look at what happened in 2017 and 2018. SpaceX number of launches started to grow steadily and already outpaced everyone else, Ariane included. Many people were skeptical about SpaceX since the beginning, even my favorite man Neil deGrasse Tyson included, but so far they've achieved everything they said they would. Falcon 9 became the most modern and cost-effective rocket as of today. Which brings me to the last part of this video, the BFR, Big Falcon Rocket. Or actually we all know that it means Big F***ing Rocket. This vehicle is supposed to be heavy enough to bring people to Mars. It's absolutely gigantic. But is it too massive to be real? Well, no. While the design and specifics of this rocket keep evolving, it's still comparable to Saturn V, the most powerful rocket that ever existed, which was used to bring astronauts to the moon. And needless to say, this is going to push up a lot of stuff in orbit. But that's the question, what stuff? There's a reason why Saturn V doesn't exist anymore. It was not built for commercial purposes and was too expensive to operate. That's why it went out of service after the moon landings. Today, while there is a huge commercial market for all kinds of satellites, it's not like there's a pressing need to bring 150 tons of payload in space at once. Despite this, things are moving forward. In the beginning of 2019, SpaceX already started to build a prototype of the Starship, which would be the second stage of the BFR and will soon start experimental suborbital flights. So if this works, the only destinations for such a rocket would be the Moon and Mars. Tourism could be one source of revenue generating about 10-15% to of SpaceX income and there's already one customer. A Japanese billionaire who will go on a tour around the moon sometime after 2020. But also the Earth itself. BFR could be used to go from one place on Earth to any other in maximum 30 minutes. But what about Mars? Who would pay to go there? Well, in an interview, Elon Musk also suggested that some wealthy individuals would want to go there, but I think that there could actually be a much better, very decent business model out there. Everything that follows are just my personal assumptions. Let's imagine that SpaceX really manages to send people to Mars. Given that SpaceX is an American company, does this mean that Mars will belong to the United States? Because although there's an international outer space treaty that forbids any country to appropriate itself anything in space, we all know that this is not how it works in practice. Take Antarctica, for example. There's a similar treaty, but several countries have installed scientific bases there and regularly make claims for territories. The United States itself owns the two biggest bases, McMurdo and the South Pole Station. In McMurdo there are more than 1000 people in summer, it's like a real city, so it's de facto American territory. Now let's get back to Mars. What happens if America is the only country able to set foot there? Well, I guess it will be soon caught up by China, but besides these two world powers I don't really see who else could pull this off. So what about all the other countries? Are they just gonna sit and watch how they are not becoming part of the new Martian civilization? Probably not. And although they will never be able to build their own rockets, they could however buy tickets for their citizens. That's why I think SpaceX could sell seats to astronauts from all the other countries that want to send their people on Mars. So BFR customers would be other space agencies or entire governments. And here there is enough money and demand, so a potential business model. I know this sounds crazy, but hopefully this will happen sooner than later. If you liked this video, please subscribe and click the bell button to be notified about all the next ones. Do check out my other videos explaining the business models of the most innovative companies.